When you think of the Falklands, chances are the first thing you think of is war. They took off from airfields in southern Argentina, equipped with Exocet missiles. Both ships were hit. Sir Galahad was immediately in flames. Maybe Margaret Thatcher? We come to talk to the people here to pay tribute to those who liberated the islands. Maybe the British Empire. Maybe Gibraltar comes to mind. Maybe you remember watching the conflict unfold on your television screen, seeing British forces fight to defend a small, rugged landscape 8,000 miles away. But there's a lot more to the Falkland Islands than 74 days of conflict 40 years ago. The story of the islands and of the islands themselves is rich, unique, and sometimes strange. The conflict, while a small part of the island's history, marks a turning point for the Falklands, a point that creates a duality, a before and after, a rural, difficult life, transforming into one of relative prosperity for its inhabitants. Since then, the way of life for Falkland Islanders has forever changed. You're listening to The Falklands Way of Life, a short podcast series produced by Falkland Islands Television. I'm your host, Charles Kershaw, and in this short series I explore the lives of inhabitants living in the remote British Overseas Territory and how life has changed over the past 200 years. This is The Falklands Way of Life. The Falklands, they got their own personality if you like. I have good memories of that time. Our standards of living were lower then, but I think generally people probably um, appreciated what they had. We're going to have to accept the fact there's going to be a new Falklands. We cannot stay an anachronism, and we're achieving that now. All the change pretty much has been for the better in my, my eyes. There's no doubt that the 1982 Falklands War had a huge impact on the Falklands. It still looms large over the islands today, especially this year in 2022, the 40th anniversary of the invasion and liberation. The 74 days of conflict left physical and psychological impacts on the islands. It also marked a very important turning point in the Falklands history. With a clear victory by British forces, The war practically ended discussions between the UK and Argentina on the sovereignty of the islands. In the minds of Britain and Falkland Islanders, the Falklands was, and still is, resolutely British. Immediately after the war, the Falklands needed to rebuild what little infrastructure it had. The capital Stanley especially, which Argentine forces had occupied for the entirety of the invasion, had taken a lot of damage. Houses had shattered windows, and the insides of many of them had been torn apart by Argentine soldiers. For many days after the war ended, the town lacked running water. Richard Stevens took part in helping to rebuild houses and Stanley at this time. I joined PWD when, when they were needing um, sort of handyman um, people just to re- replace the glass from the windows that had been blown out and to replace the tin that had got shrapnel holes or other war damage. So we spent months and months just rebuilding stuff, making people's homes secure again, watertight, (laughs) windproof-ish. Did you have much experience in that before you got the job or was it just sort of like, (laughs) just went for it basically? uh, Yeah, I had a a little bit, but uh, there, there were folk far more experience than me. And did things get repaired like quite quickly after the war? Was it quite a quick change or did it take a while for things to get back to normal? It took a while because again, you know, there weren't, there weren't enough of us really to do it quickly. So it must have been quite a few months of replacing stuff, you know, windows, tin, before it was that part of the job was over. The Shackleton report of the late 1970s, recommending a number of ways to improve and diversify the Falklands economy, regained its relevance once again. The large farms began to be divided up, and people like Richard were, instead of working for a farm manager, finally able to own their own farm. And we went there so we'd have the deposit for the farm, if we got it, because it was only if in that stage. There was a programme um, called the news magazine on on Fridays and uh, they said oh Richard and Tony Stevens have, have um, secured Port Sussex farm so we we heard over the radio 
bit bit impersonal, but at least at least we'd got it. Islanders like Tony Smith were able to visit the UK for the first time immediately after the war. We had an opportunity to travel on the MV Norland. It was a North Sea ferry that had been requisitioned for transporting troops down here. So we were able to travel to Ascension Island on that ship on its second voyage after the war had ended, taking the 2nd Battalion of the Scots Guards back to Ascension. So we, we got on that ship with the Scots Guards and had a 10-day voyage to Ascension and then flew with the RAF back to Bryce Norton. So that was my first time to the UK and uh, I really enjoyed the whole experience. So basically as soon as I got back I started saving immediately and then every, more or less every two years I, I tried to go to the UK. I mean I had, you know, again uh, relatives and, and, and so on there and once I'd connected with them, you know, we, we kept in touch and so for, for some years I was doing that. After 82, what was it like seeing the Falklands change kind of quite rapidly over that kind of that period in the 80s? It took a little while. It was, wasn't really until the military had moved to MPA, so Stanley was, wasn't really just a military base. And so it really started to settle down into, into the Falklands proper again. While at Fox Bay, Richard Cockwell gave up farming, instead building and managing the settlement's war mill. We finished up then with uh, the farms as we have them now. They've moved around a bit. Some have got bigger, some have got smaller. And the price of wool improved at the time. And so farming has become quite successful, particularly since we've established a, uh, an, an abattoir so they can actually have a market for their meat if they wish to produce it. I put myself up for election for camp and got elected and I remain um, either as a camp representative or a standing representative until I retired from politics in 2009. And why were you interested in, in becoming in politics? Another? Yeah. Because I, I, I'm determined, to, I was determined, I'm still determined to see the Falklands being a success. What has happened since 1982, the changes are absolutely astounding when you think about it. Our economy, I think, was only, budget was only somewhere around about four or five million. And now we have uh, a budget which is nearly a hundred million. And we have somewhere about 740 million pounds in reserves. Today, the Falklands is a relatively wealthy place. In terms of income per capita, it ranks as the fifth richest place in the world. So how did this rapid transformation of the Falklands economy take place? The Shackleton Report recommended establishing a development agency to grow and diversify the island's economy beyond sheep farming, which had driven it for so many years. The Falkland Islands Development Corporation, or FIDC, was created a year after the war in 1983. Mike Summers was the second general manager of FIDC, taking over in 1989. The constant refrain in all of those days was, uh, was economic diversif diversification, sustainable diversification. Tourism and, and fisheries uh, took up most of people's time um, because there were big industries to set up. You know, there was nothing, there was just nothing. And, and it started from nothing. There was no knowledge of fishing here. There was no deep sea fishing here that, 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 in, it, that remotely touched the shore. Um, so it all had to start from, from scratch. One of the key roles of FIDC was to help these people find a way um, to, to own the resource, really. It, it was a very exciting time and it was actually seeing the islands become self-sufficient but for their defence was a great moment for Falkland Islanders. My name is Jan Cheek and I was co-owner and director of Fortuna Limited in the 10-year period following my husband's death. Jan's husband, John Cheek, with his business partner, Stuart Wallace, set up the first fishing company owned and operated in the Falklands, Fortuna Limited. Trained as a teacher, um, again in the UK, and came back, taught for the greater part of the next 20 years and taught up till the end of the 80s. Well through the 1970s we became aware 
volumes of squid and fin fish that were coming out of our waters with the only small return being um, harbour dues from, from Barclay Sand. It was being vacuumed up by these huge factory trawlers from Russia and Poland and all these other places. We knew there was something of value there, but I do remember a, a well-meaning gent from the Foreign Office saying, oh, no, 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 there's a, a few blue whiting out there and they're full of parasites. No one would want them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so we were up against it in that respect. And it was uh, frowned on by the Foreign Office because they felt it would cause ructions with Argentina. In 1986, the UK finally brought about the means to complete the transformation of the islands, the establishment of a 150-mile fishing zone. That was the point when John, my late husband, and Stuart Wallace saw people coming in who knew no more about fisheries than they did and getting onto the the books of Stanley Fisheries. They gave up safe, well-paid jobs with cable and wireless, borrowed a little money, traveled the world learning about fisheries and creating partnerships. But they didn't want to just be licensed brokering. They wanted to establish a real Falklands fishery. Not everyone was in favor of seeing local people get involved. Stuart on one occasion was threatened by one of the other companies but in the meantime John and Stuart just plugged away. Um, first of all they invested in voyages, fishing voyages. Um, we put all our savings into it at that point John and I and when that began to give a return, they ploughed it all back again, eventually in small ships, uh, small shares in the ships. They had succeeded in, in creating that real Falklands fishing industry and many other companies followed. Overnight, the economy grew almost tenfold. And once local companies started getting ownership and more of the proceeds came in, both in money spent on shore and in tax returns, then, then it grew even more to what we have today. What was it like sort of in that period where the fishing industry was increasing and, and changing the economy, you know, pretty, pretty much overnight? How did it feel to be in the Falklands at that time? It was a very exciting time. Uh, it wasn't w w without its headaches. Uh, Resources, you know, you wanted to build things, do things, finding people to do it was difficult, still is today to some degree. But it, it was a huge learning curve for, for all of us, but fascinating when, when you're actually creating an industry. Falklands fisheries are the main source of income for the islands, accounting for about 60% of its GDP. The largest source of government revenues are license fees and corporation tax from fishing companies. The Falklands political process gave more power in the hands of the islanders themselves. The constitution was updated. The elected legislative council, equivalent to the Falklands members of parliament, saw its number of members increase to eight. Even during this time of rapid change driven by the fishing industry, the Falklands countryside, also known as camp, experienced a much slower change. It took time for those living outside of Stanley to become better connected to the rest of the islands. Growing up here in the 80s and 90s, like at Fox Bay, that was it. My world was like 50 people and I had known them since I was born. Um, so that's a totally different, totally different universe now. Uh, and that's, and I think that will continue. That's Richard Cockwell's youngest son, Sam, speaking. Born in the 80s after the war, Sam spent his childhood living a rural lifestyle on Fox Bay. Yeah, and didn't really come back into town until I was in my uh, pre-teens really um, for school so I was at Fox Bay I mean we came to town for like trips and stuff but didn't really yeah I was at Fox Bay for pretty much the, the duration. So how many people were in Fox Bay like at that time I mean did you spend pretty much all your time there? Best part of 50 people I'd think Fox Bay East and West and the, the assortment of kids um, that would uh, kind of come and go with their parents sometimes. Looking back on it it was it, it, we were very isolated um, but I grew up with it so you didn't really think of it in those ways. 
like growing up in the camp was amazing like it was it was living the good life you know i mean we we had a lot of freedom it was a totally different world than where we are now um and i and i yeah i kind of really loved it and it was very simple it seemed very simple to my parents it wasn't it was a total logistical nightmare to try and <laughs> you know keep a business going and and everything else in a totally remote environment but um as a child it was awesome so my my mother and it's still at mum's house actually she used to have this 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 brass um, handbell and basically I would just stooge off in the afternoon and there'd be other kids around or whatever so we'd go off and and um, when it was time for me to go home for tea mum would ring this bell and I knew that was when it was tea time and I had to had to get home. The process of building between eight and nine hundred kilometres of gravel roads linking all major settlements outside of Stanley took place over a twenty year period beginning in the late 80s and early 90s. Yeah, that was a massive change because all of a sudden you could drive to Hill Cove, which from Fox Bay is a journey. I mean, that's a day beforehand. And then you could drive there in 40 minutes. We used to do these things at Christmas time where there was a couple of farms would host um, barbecues and stuff for Christmas time. And we'd all, there'd be this big expedition. We'd all go off road and it was all this big adventure and yeah, it was great fun and awesome, awesome off-roading and stuff. And then, um, yeah, with the advent, the advent of the roads, Going to those barbecues took like 20 minutes. <laughs> Whereas before it was like a two hour, three hour journey. In the 90s, broadcast TV outside of Stanley and other technological upgrades like the internet appeared. I was 12, I remember it really well. It was at Fox Bay and we got, we got TV broadcast for the first time. Because up until then, my aunt and uncle in the UK would record things on VHS and send us videotapes um, in the mail, which you'd get via surf So then I'd have a videotape of like cartoons and stuff. People used to like, bring in videos. We had a good, like everyone would have all the VHSs labeled their names because you would just swap stuff all the time. Um, so yeah, sometimes you'd be around someone's house that you hadn't seen for a while and be like, hold on, that's one of my videos. <laughs> With the advent of the internet, I mean, that was when I was at school, I remember the internet being you know, delivered for the first time. You know, the internet though, initially had a, an impact, but as, you know, as with everywhere else, the impact has grown and grown and grown and now we're absolutely dependent upon it. But the internet as well I know has got a lot better in the past few years before I came in terms of I was told in kind of the mid 2010s you know it was difficult to load like a YouTube video or something is that right? Oh yeah no it was, it was incredibly slow I mean my my use of YouTube was pretty minimal up until you know till I went to college and uni and everything because it was just so slow people used to laugh at me because there was a there was a little kitchen downstairs at my halls of residence and I would set a you click on a YouTube video and immediately pause it to leave it to load. And I'd go downstairs to make myself a cup of tea. Um, and, and that really, you know, that, that was a huge change of mindset as well, you know, cause I was like, I, I suddenly, it actually took me a while to realize that I didn't need to do that. Stanley local Nick Roberts is the deputy editor of the local newspaper, The Penguin News. Yeah, absolutely huge change. And I mean, we were actually, we were a little bit slower getting mobile phones than the rest of the, rest of the UK as well. And I remember somewhere between 2006 and 2008, I saw a bunch of my friends all gathered around sitting in a little circle, like as I was going to school. That's, that's strange. I took a, went down to the pitch and I realized that it was that one of them had got a mobile and they're all basically taking it in turns, passing around this mobile phone to play snake on it. You know, it was hugely exciting. With the increasing wealth and economic activity in the Falklands, Stanley grew in size. The population of the city now stands at around 2,964, with relatively recent housing developments helping to create this growth. I mean, I remember uh, some of the kids in my family, um, and this is how very, uh, not in my family, sorry, in my class. I remember them getting new houses on the east end of Stanley. All of that housing development around where Kelper 4 is. Yeah. You know, that didn't exist when I was a kid, um, nor did, you know, any of the, the housing development on Sappers Hill. So that, I mean, if you think about K4, that housing development plus Sappers Hill, that has like almost like another, how many, what, 20%, yeah, 30% like of Stanley. Easily. Yeah. So yeah, in that, in that time period, like Stanley's grown by at least 30% in just in terms of housing. Completely. So, you know, it's, it is absolutely exploded. You're kind of seeing the the history in the making almost you know because you talking about you know saying oh you know the, the town didn't go much further than the cemetery saying things like that makes it sound like I'm much older than I am you know that's not the average conversation that someone under thirty would have but here at 
the sheer scale of growth. That, that's absolutely a thing. With this increase in prosperity has come better public services for everyone in the islands. Stanley's Hospital gives islanders the equivalent of the UK's National Health Service, giving free medical care and dental care to all. Higher education is completely funded by the government, allowing the children of the Falklands far more opportunity than many of their parents or grandparents ever had. At the time I went away, only two students a year went away at 12 to go to grammar schools in Dorset. My daughters came through the system. Now I see my grandchildren, one is about to go to university and one about to embark on A-levels. And it's not just for them, it's for all the, all the children in the islands. And that I think has been the greatest change. And with education comes confidence, confidence to tackle things and confidence in the future. Because we're small, we can adapt quickly. And the, I think the rate of change that we've seen over the last 15, 20 years, so since sort of 2000, is so much faster, it's exponentially accelerating from the previous 20 years in terms of progress. So, you know, the, the changes in the last 20 years are significant. The changes in the next 20 years are going to be enormous. Coming from the perspective of someone from the UK, it's hard to imagine the level of change that the Falklands has experienced over a relatively short period of time. The rural, almost subsistence way of life for the majority of the population had changed and was no longer the only option. At last, there was hope, opportunity, and a clear future for the islands. Even today, it feels as though the Falklands has so many more opportunities and possibilities right around the corner. That takes us up to the present day. It's now four decades on from the 1982 war. So what does the Falklands look like today? And how has its way of life changed? Next time on the Falklands way of life, we'll be discussing this and what's still to come in the story of the islands. There's huge decisions in the making right now. We're at this kind of crossroads. So yeah, you're always looked after here, which is great. You know, people, people care a lot, which is great, um, but that can also be frustrating. But you're never lonely, or very rarely lonely here. It's, I guess it's different to anywhere else in the world. The, the potential and the, the possibilities for the Falklands look good and promising.